Welcome back, guys, to the JPS Podcast. And in this episode, I'm honoured to have Brian Miner uh, on the show, and we talk about all things uh, program design, progressive overload, uh, training intensity, measuring hypertrophy, and some more nuanced concepts related to resistance training uh, for hypertrophy. So, guys, I really think a lot of you will benefit from this chat. Enjoy the show and make sure that you subscribe to the channel and like the video and comment with any questions that you have. So, man, so welcome, guys. Today we have Brian Miner on the show. So for those of you who don't know Brian, uh, he's got a health and exercise degree. He's the owner of Brian Miner Coaching and Iron Woman, which we're actually discussing uh, before we came on air. They're doing some great things over there, so I recommend you guys check them out. Uh, he's a USAPL uh, raw powerlifter, IP and NGA pro, uh, and he's a pretty brilliant dude. Uh, he's got a very good mind uh, when it comes to all things fitness, uh, especially training, and he thinks a little bit outside the box, which is why I wanted to have a chat to him today, uh, based on a few of his discussions uh, that he's had on his Instagram, so make sure you guys go follow him, because he puts out some really uh, good content there, and asks the big questions that nobody's asking, uh, and also based on some of the discussions he's had with Steve Hall uh, and Eric Helms of late, which I'll link in the description box below. So make sure you check out that podcast and AEO on the 3DMJ uh, YouTube channel. And in today's episode, I want to talk uh, a little more about muscle hypertrophy because that's what we all want, right? We all want to get big and jacked like Brian. Uh, and I thought, Brian, we would kick off with some general discussion uh, around the nuts and bolts of program design for hypertrophy. Um, if you want to speak to that uh, as to how we apply the latest research uh, to, the, to the big variables, um, and what we need to do when we're looking to design, you know, micro cycle to get massive like Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first, well, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure, and I think this this is a topic that I could talk about for forever. Um, but it, it's interesting because I think we, there's a lot we still don't know that we're still teasing out, and I think that's exciting. Um, so when it comes to hypertrophy, I think it's it's one of those things that it's, there seems to be this misconception, and it, I shouldn't even call it a misconception. There's, there's the idea that volume dry, directly drives hypertrophy, and it's simply, um, it, it's correlated. And it's, there's, there's a spectrum of quality when it comes to volume. And, you know, there's, for people that are unaware of, you know, the size principle, a lot of what I, we'll probably be discussing is going to be based off of that in terms of muscle fiber recruitment, you know, increasing force demands or the increasing um, demands to maintain force output, you know, we there, we then increase uh, muscle fiber recruitment to meet that demand. So um, I, I have a blog and I wrote a post sort of regarding, um, regarding the, the idea that, that fiber, like that progressive overload isn't necessarily just increasing weight on the bar. Um, and I think most people know that, but conceptually, I'm not sure everybody really understands the, the idea behind like what drives hypertrophy and um, the, the individual fiber tension that's applied. And a lot of this is, is you know, just conceptual, but I mean, we know mechanical tension is a huge driver for hypertrophy, and I think a lot of people immediately associate that with increased weight on the bar, and that that's true. But we also have, you know, a pile of research that's showing um, that lighter loads, you know, taken close to failure, or is is beneficial for hypertrophy. Is is high, um, you know, high intensity loading. So, what uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is when we look at tension, is it is it sort of thinking of it as tension per active fiber, um, tension per the amount of fibers that are shouldering that load. And I think um, when, when you think in terms of that idea and that model, um, a lot of what we observe in research um, tends to make a lot more sense. So um, when it comes to programming for hypertrophy, I see a lot of people, you know, well-intentioned that just focus on increasing volume over time, which it's, it's going to be highly correlated, but there, the emphasis should still be on, on quality. Um, and the emphasis should still be on training close enough to failure where you're getting 
a an efficient response. And I think the there's sort of a phobia of, of training to failure and the pendulum sort of swung in the other direction. I know, Jacob, we've talked about this a little bit um, and, you know, chatting back and forth. And I think there's that that phobia has, has sort of sabotaged some people's progress. Um, and certainly, I mean, if you train to failure too early on in a session and you sacrifice downstream volume that you're able to perform, that's going to sacrifice the amount of imposed tension on those like active fibers. And so the way I kind of think of hypertrophy is like each active fiber has like a threshold of impulse, a threshold of tension and duration of exposure to that tension that needs to be reached in order for an optimal hypertrophy you know, signal, um, you know, signaling cascade to occur. And that that is is kind of the the nerded out <laughs> explanation for for uh, for what I'm going to talk about, but really when it comes to hypertrophy, I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. I think you know James Krieger and Brad Schoenfeld have done um, some great work in meta analyses that have shown you know somewhere between you know 12 and 20 sets per body part um, seems to be the ideal range um, for hypertrophy and most people fall within that range anyway. And it's, I think it's just more making sure that you're not, uh, you know, you find that sweet spot where you're, you're getting and tapping into those high threshold motor units without compromising too much downstream performance. So uh, I, there's, there's a lot, lot to stem off of that. So I don't know what you want to talk about. Yeah. Kind of awesome. First. Yeah. 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 I, I think that was perfect. And you touched on a lot of, uh, really good points, uh, in, you know, the conceptual uh, understanding of, you know, what, what is happening uh, at a physiological level when we, when we go in and train, which is, I think, very useful for listeners. Uh, and to build off that, you know, a, a lot of people, when they think of a program, I guess they get overwhelmed in, you know, how they do that. Um, and something I've discussed with uh, Ian McCarthy before is, you know, that really for hypertrophy, if we set up a well-designed micro cycle, it's literally a function of, you know, progressive overload. We don't need to be as... Um, you know, mindful of, you know, the periodization or the necessarily the phasic structure of things um, because, by, you know, we don't have a certain dead, deadline or time frame where we need to peak performance, uh, where we're intentionally accruing fatigue, um, you know, in order to elicit these adaptations. So I guess, you know, when we set up that micro cycle, do you want to speak to that and what we need to do? Yeah. So I, I still think... You know, while periodization is going to have less of an impact on hypertrophy as a, you know, as a low strength, I do think it's important when we think about accruing an overload stimulus, like we still want to be recovered yeah, before definitely. we get back into the gym, like get train close to failure again. Otherwise, you're not going to be, like, you're not going to be able to access those high threshold motor units for, um, to begin with. So... Recovery is important. So organizing your training in a manner where you can be fresh when you're, you know, can get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of overload is still going to be important. So across like a micro cycle, you know, for, for most bodybuilders or with a hypertrophy, I'll say any athlete with a hypertrophy focused goal, um, you know, having them train a muscle group, you know, at least a couple times a week. Is, is, I think, sufficient for almost everybody. Um, I mean, there's certainly outliers, and I think frequency can be a, a tool to increase volume when volume across, like, a single day becomes problematic. Um, but that being said, I, you know, we have, we see a lot of bodybuilders that go in and just bomb a muscle group once per week that still make progress. So it's like we know that that objective is still being met. Mm. Um and it can just be optimized a little bit more by increasing the frequency just a little bit. So I think even like an upper lower split can be very beneficial um, or push pull legs, for example. <clears throat> and then when you get into like the, the powerlifting side of it, like a dual athlete, you might increase the frequency more from like a skill acquisition standpoint. But I would say for the most part, when it comes to just hypertrophy, if that's the bottom line objective, I don't really use high frequency is is a variable in and of itself to drive that. It's more of a, and this is something I think Eric Helms has said in the past that I've mentioned before, it's like it's a valve for volume. It's like when you start to just 
see diminishing returns in terms of quality, then you can have that day and have <clears throat> be able to create a greater tension overload for the week as a whole. But even then, I think you're you still want to be cognizant of making, ensuring that you're recovered heading into each session and you're not overreaching um, to the extent that maybe a power lifter would intentionally. Awesome. Awesome. And to, yeah, I guess uh, follow up on uh, that would be to make sure that you overload your training and that it is disruptive enough uh, to exceed, you know, prior training stresses so that we do get those adaptations um, and you wrote a brilliant article uh, dissecting this topic, and I wanted to chat to you further about this. So something that you stated was load progression uh, is practical, and this is what you uh, started touching on at the, just the beginning of the show, uh, but it is not necessary on a physiological level for hypertrophy. So in terms of overloading our training, you know, can you speak uh, further to this and you know, outline um, you know, some of the ways that you would uh, overload a program or you know, some practical means uh, that the guys can take away from that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and I've had some people ask me since I've written that, you know, like, are, are you against load progression? And, and absolutely not. I mean, I like the people like to read uh, the internet quite literally. So, no, it, all I'm saying is, I mean, all we really need to know to drive home the point that load progression isn't necessary is if you go from a training cycle where you're training at like 80% of your max or 75% of your max and then you train at 65% of your max the next training cycle on average, if you still make progress, then that should show you that load isn't a dependent variable when it comes to comes to strength. And so um, we know that, like I said earlier, you can grow across any rep range. And so really what it comes down to, and what I touched on earlier, is, is achieving a high enough degree of tension and duration of exposure to that tension on a specific fiber level to cause that cascade, like that protein synthetic cascade um, on a physiological level. So you see a lot of bodybuilders that go in and, you know, we, the evidence-based community likes to kind of poke fun of them, but they, they go in and they still meet that same objective. <clears throat> They're more just achieving it by more of a shotgun approach, you know, like they, they go in and they, they leave no doubts that they've achieved enough tension to create an overload stimulus. And so overload doesn't necessarily like when I really dissect it and think through it, it's less about like performing more reps or performing more load. It's more about performing more applied tension. Um, and when you think of it in that, in that manner, you can see why a whole spectrum of strategies can work very well for hypertrophy. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, when it comes to the practicality of progression, I, I certainly still implement load progression. I'm a big fan of using um, double progression, you know, working it within a rep range. Once you can achieve all your sets, the high end of that rep range, you know, adding a rep to each set or, adding a rep to your final set and working kind of right to left. Um, yeah. That works well for things like, um, you know, isolation work, like medial delts, like lateral raises. You're not going to be increasing weight very frequently on those. Um, so it's like you can kind of take those, push those last sets and kind of work your way, you know, towards your first set, performing more reps as you go until you're at the top end of that rep range, then you increase the weight. And so, um, and so it can also just be, I, I think it can be as, as long, now this is as long as you're fully recovered. I think it can be as easy as just chasing, you know, performing a certain amount of sets, say three or four sets, whatever your habitual amount of sets is, and just kind of chasing a relative intensity threshold. So it's like, say, say you wanted to stop a rep shy of failure or two rep shy of failure on each set. Like you could do that. And if you're, if you find you're gradually able to perform more reps across all your sets, then you're achieving an overload because you're adapting to it. So it, you, people have to remember that like you, you want to look at that bottom line outcome. Like a lot of people think like, okay, well, did I do more weight this week or did my tonnage increase? And like, those are all like indirect measures of the objective that we're after. And if you just look at simply like, 
it might, think of it just in terms of total stress, imposed stress. It's like, am I doing more total work? Am I imposing more total stress? And then you're probably, if, if you're able to do it, then it's because you've adapted to the point to be capable of doing it. And so that means that an overload has occurred. Um, and I think, and I, I was on a podcast recently and I was kind of complaining about this, but like one of the pieces of advice that I don't really like when it comes to hypertrophy is, you know, perform more volume over time. Like it's, it's true. It's definitely correlated, but it's also how a lot of people get hurt. Um, they, they like arbitrarily just try to force more reps, especially when you get strong enough as well, you can do more damage. Yeah. So like, say you're, you're training and your average RPE on your final set is like an eight. And then the next week you do one more rep and you get it to a nine RPE. It's like, you didn't necessarily like you, you've imposed more stress, but it doesn't necessarily mean you've adapted to anything yet. It just means that you just pushed your effort one unit further for that day. So, um, it, it's something that you have to look at through a wide lens and look at like, okay, on average, am I able to do more, um, Am I capable of handling more stress over time rather than just on a session to session basis? Yeah, fantastic. You you mentioned a number of uh, things I want to delve into there. So just to recap for the guys, um, you know, uh, training intensity is exposure to tension in both magnitude and duration, um, and volume is simply the exposure to that uh, stress or tension. Um, and I think a lot mm-hmm. of people have uh, misunderstood. Um, a lot of the uh, research has come out that's shown that, you know, volume's high, highly correlated with hypertrophy and they go, add sets every week, you know, over the course of a mesocycle. It's like, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't yeah. want to do that. Uh, so, and that's what Brian's uh, getting at there. So, uh, to speak to overload, um, you know, and training to failure. So, we are mentioning a couple of things there, the RPE scale, which is a subjective measure of uh, intensity. And what I want to discuss is, if somebody has never trained to failure because they've got into training, um, you know, and initially fell into the evidence-based community and seen that, oh, hey, you know, we don't need to train to failure, so I won't train to failure. How do they know uh, what their RPE is, or you know, how do they compare to something that they've never achieved before? Um, because sure, they may be overloading their training over the course of you know their program, but it may not be disruptive enough uh, to you know. F- stimulate adaptations, um, you know, and they may even be well below, you know, the minimum effective dose. So, Brian, have at it. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I, I, I think, you know, we've talked about this before. It's like, how do you know your proximity or failure if you've never actually hit failure? And novice lifters have a, you know, they're, they've shown in research um, that, you know, bar speed in advanced lifters at a certain, you know, high RPE is going to be lower in advanced lifters, just indicating that they're able to push a bit further. Like they know their ceiling a bit more accurately. Um, and so another thing kind of to, to mention is RPE, it's always going to be a subjective scale. So, you know, when people you see on Instagram, like, will you rate my RPE for this? Like really what they're saying is like, in, you know, taking like a large average of people, like, how does my bar speed correlate with what you would expect? But yeah. if they rate it at a 9 RPE and it looks like a 5 to you, it's still a 9 RPE for them. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're one rep shy of failure. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there is that disparity there that you have to kind of keep in mind um, when you're using RPE. And I think it is useful for, for people that aren't used to it, like rather than... Um, like rather than having them test like a one RM program with a percentage, I think it, it can be handy to give them, you know, plus sets or take their last set to failure and, and almost be supervised. Like if you have the opportunity to have, you know, if you work with an athlete remotely, like say they're taking a bicep curl, like something safe to start. You can't, you can't of, program you know, loads just, to someone's bicep curl online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You would never do that. <laughs> but yeah, you would, you could kind of see like, okay, how hard are they actually trying um, but their subjective effort is still going to be high, but that doesn't really mean that they're fully, it, it, well, <clears throat> let me back up a second. It could mean that they're recruiting to a maximal degree of what they're capable of. It just could be that they're not, they haven't 
progressed enough neurologically to access those higher threshold motor units to begin with. So it could be that they're they're recruiting the full pool of what they have access to, but it's like it's not optimal long term because they have this whole other level that they can get to. So um, when it comes to you know activating full you know like full fiber muscle recruitment, I think when people are and I don't know if there's actual data on this, but I think novices, they probably are coming close to recruiting what they're fully capable of, even though the bar speed is a lot slower. Um, but it is important for them to push to consistently touch that ceiling so they can actually develop neurologically and have access to those higher threshold motor units, which really shouldn't take long. I mean, most you know, we see anytime you see those newbie strength gains, that's what's occurring is, is people are becoming more neurologically efficient. So, um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a couple things. Another thing to kind of keep in mind is a lot of the research that's looked at failure is, is done using isolation movements. Um, you know, things like leg extensions and it's, it's a lot harder to cheat on those than it is something like a leg press. And so, or a squat leg press, is, you know, whatever, but something like a squat, it's like, if you say, you know, okay, the data seems to indicate that, you know, I need to take something within about three reps shy of failure. As soon as you throw in multiple muscle groups in a compound movement, you're like, everything's not going to be failing at once here. So that's, a, that's another thing that's important to realize is that as you, if you ever notice like your form start to break down, it's typically because a localized muscle group has, has exhausted itself or it can no longer maintain force output for that you know, particular range of motion um, at, that, at that load. So you break form to compensate for that. And like squats are a good example because you'll see people whose hips start to kick back and they start to have that like good morning squat and they might be able to push out. That might start occurring at rep five of 10 mm. or at rep four of 10 but they might be able to push a little bit higher in terms of, um, you know, grind out more reps. What that doesn't mean though, is that their quads need to go that much further. Like their quads may have, have reached that RPE threshold, so to speak. And so you almost have to kind of break down those compound movements into individual muscle groups if they're all failing at a different rate. And, you want to, like, if you notice, like, as a novice athlete, like, if you notice your form start to break on a compound movement, that means something has probably reached its its capacity, and you've probably reached full recruitment, at least in theory, um, for whatever muscle group is the weak link in that exercise. So, you know, for, for those novice athletes, I think just keeping an eye on technique, and when you see techniques start to break, that's probably a sign that you've you've past where you really need to be um and so i wouldn't say like you need to learn to train to failure and sacrifice form to get there and i mean there's obviously the you know there's muscular failure versus like mechanical failure there's differences there and i think a lot of people kind of brush that under the rug but there, there's something to that um because i think you pro there's a lot of compound movements that people may stop at like an rpe6 where they probably have had full muscle fiber recruitment in some muscle groups. Um, and that's important to, to acknowledge. Awesome, man. Give me one second. My daughter's just come in. I've just got to send her out. <laughs> Aiden, can you please hop in? Like, I will. I will. I need you. This is my dad. I think it's like 15. There's my kid. Yeah. 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 I'm still on the phone. Oh, it's a madhouse, Brian. I'm sorry. Lucky, oh, we, no, no, lucky no. we can edit this stuff out. Now, that, that was no, brilliant. No. I think, um, yes, yeah, so you touched on a lot of really good points there. And the, the big question is, you know, if this is the case and if load progression um, isn't necessarily going to be indicative that, you know, we've built muscle or we're seeing changes, you know, on a fiber level, uh, or even adding reps and you know adding tension or perceived effort uh, is you know highly subjective and has its own limitations. Detecting quantifiable changes in muscle is obviously very very difficult. 
So can you uh, speak to this and you know talk about what are the ways that we can measure hypertrophy? Obviously, you know visuals have their own limitations. You know DEXA scans and you know other body composition assessments. Um, it seems that you know just adding weight to the bar is also you know a very flawed methodology. Uh, you know for a number of reasons that you've outlined. You know, it seems like we're we're just up sheep creek without a paddle here. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I don't know if, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. I don't know if, if adding weight to the bar, I think, can be a good indicator that, that overload has occurred. I just don't know if it's something we necessarily always have to chase in order to induce overload. So um, say your joints are beat up and you just, it's like, I can't add any more weight. You know, you can always do more reps and achieve like an overload tension stimulus. Um, so that was the main point that I wanted to say there. Now, yep. to kind of segue off of that is, <clears throat> you're right. Like, it, it's not always adding weight is, like, if you get stronger, it doesn't necessarily mean you've gotten bigger. And when we think of, you know, the, I mean, we see power lifters who train with, you know, during a peaking phase, you know, we can see that, like, oftentimes there's actually some research that's shown, like, in a normal linear progression model, when they hit those intensity stages, that hypertrophy drops off and can kind of regress a little bit. Um, but you see their 1RM go up because of, you know, the, the increased demand on the neurological adaptation. So you, you want to take that into account. You have to rule out, like, are these totally, is this just increased skill acquisition or is this increased hypertrophy? Um, and kind of going back to the isolation versus compound movement, um, there's also some evidence to indicate that, you know, muscle retention and performance is more correlated with hypertrophy in isolation versus compound movements, just because it's less skill dependent. Um, and so I would say focus, like don't focus strictly on like your heavy compounds. Like we, we want to progress in those obviously, but isolation work will probably give you a bit more insight into like localized muscle groups and, and you want to look at performance across a spectrum of sets rather than just your first. So say you're doing three sets or four sets of, of eight to 10 and you decide to just take your first set to, you know, perform up to a 10 RPE, <clears throat> like that's going to make it look like on paper, like, Oh, I'm increased performance, but then your performance is going to suffer. So you, you know, at a given relative intensity, like with a relative intensity match, the exercise match, then you can actually look at something um, in rep range match. Like say you're matching, doing the same rep range up to the same RPE, but performing more tonnage. Like that's an instance where tonnage can actually provide some indication that you're progressing across, as long as you're looking at the full spectrum of sets. So um, I would say like for quads, like leg extensions, if you have them in your program are a, a good indicator. If you can perform consistently heavier across multiple sets on those within the same rep range, you're probably growing. And I would, I would stay away from using rep ranges, like in the low, low rep ranges, you know, below, you know, six, you know, five to six is an indication of, of hypertrophy. And it doesn't mean like if you get stronger, like strength can in, will, or hypertrophy will, strongly influenced downstream strength, but there's also that huge neurological component um, and skill acquisition side of it. So those, I think the, you know, the cliff notes version of that is like moderate to higher rep ranges across multiple sets using um, less skill dependent compounds or isolation movements is, is probably the best advice and takeaway I could, I could provide it. And I, I have to give uh, James Krieger a, a shout out for this. His, in his research review, he has, he has an entire section um, dedicated to talking about like progression, like how to really um, quantify progress when you can't necessarily visually see it. Um, and those are, those are some of the, that's some of the information he's conveyed, which is, is excellent. Yeah, I 100% agree, and I've uh, read James's uh, article on that, and I'll uh, link that in the description box below because it's definitely worth checking out, guys. Um, and something I've also observed, and uh, I spoke about this, and I more specifically 
um, you know, started thinking about, you know, how we measure hypertrophy uh, in, you know, in terms of performance um, after your discussion with Eric um, on his channel. And something I've observed and thought about is, you know, we want these, you know, repetition, uh, you know, strength improvements across multiple sets for sure. Um, you know, but a lot of people uh, also don't take into account, you know, the total amount of work uh, within their their micro cycle or their meso cycle as well. Um, you know, it's almost as if, you know, they may reduce their volume to, you know, spike performance or they might deliberately, you know, take an extra rest day before they go and train legs and then claim PB. Um, you know, and, and that's just another form of peaking in essence. It's just, you know, you know, testing a one or a max. Um, yeah. you, you know, and manipulate a whole host of variables to see, you know, progress for the sake of progress. It's almost as if hypertrophy, you know, in terms of performance is something that occurs, you know, over longer time spans, uh, as opposed to just this like acute, uh, you know, in set or session. Um, so I was just wondering your thoughts on that, Brian. Yeah, definitely. I mean, anytime, anytime you're using performance is a proxy for development, you're, you're going to have a confounding variable with just the neurological aspect of it, you know, regardless of rep range. It's not like your nervous system only contributes to strength in low rep ranges. I mean, it's, it's certainly everything. Um, in hypertrophy, it does, it takes, it takes a lot of time. Um, and so, yeah, I think using, using it is a, something to view kind of through a wide lens and, and compare, make sure you're kind of comparing apples to apples. Like you said, you can, you can artificially make the situation look more favorable than it is by reducing fatigue. Um, and, or, you know, like you said, peaking, it's like, if you take an added rest day, that's, that's essentially, you know, on a micro cycle level, what a taper is, you know, it's like, we're, we're reducing fatigue and you're going to see a net increase in performance. Um, so you can't use, you can't, it doesn't mean that you're not making progress if that's what you do, but it doesn't mean necessarily that you are either. Um, but rather than I think worry about it, it's like if you just focus on like the basic principles, you know, and still try to implement progressive overload, like you're going to see on a week to week basis like you will see those progressions, um, you know, across a mesocycle, I should say. So like, it's not like you're going to have to wait, you know, 12 months to see if you've made any progress in terms of hypertrophy, if you're using performance as a metric. Um, but you should be able to be adding additional reps. Um, and you just kind of have to trust the process at that point and know that there's, there's going to be, um, you know, a pot of gold at the end of it. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that it keeps training fun, focusing on performance. Um, but I think a lot of people really obsess over it. And like I said, we kind of goes back to the, the bodybuilder that just goes in and bombs a muscle group once a week, like the evidence-based community, like we, you know, we point fingers at them and, and sometimes laugh, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know anybody who goes like I can go down to the, the gym down the street um, that I train at and, and there's people in there that, that don't know the principles of, you know, what drives hypertrophy. They just go in and they work hard and they just consistently work hard and they're consistently like, they're still getting bigger. And so they're achieving overload. It's just, they're, they're chasing kind of, they're using fatigue as their, their metric rather than performance. It's like, okay, once I reach this threshold of, of fatigue, you know, in intracession, like in terms of subjective, like RPE, like I want to push each set to this RPE. I want to make sure I eat and recover. And then I want to come back and I want to do it again. If they're doing that, they're probably achieving overload. Um, and you see that like very rarely do you see somebody who's consistently at the gym that is working hard that's not making any progress. I mean, it happens certainly, but it's not, uh, I guess the, the bottom line point I'm trying to make is there's like, you don't need to overcomplicate it either. Like it's performance is a, is a good metric, you know, when examined through a wide lens. But I think a lot of people have sort of forgotten the relative effort side of the equation when it comes to that. And they're focused more on like, how can I mathematically induce overload rather than just like fucking working harder, you know? So it's, it's, uh, 
that both of them, both of them are required, um, like a, a strategic plan and just the effort to put into it. And I think, you know, we're, we're highly adaptive um, systems and, you know, we have people that are proponents of extremely high frequency routines that are also afraid of training to failure, you know, and it's like both of them are like, but both of them are going to be extremely stressful on the system. Um, but we adapt and, and I think people have sort of forgotten our ability to, to adapt to these situations. And a lot of, I'm kind of going off track here, but, but a lot of the, the fear of training to failure seems to stem from the inability to keep performance high, you know, or due to muscle damage. And like that, that is the whole concept behind the repeated bout effect. It's like, if you, if you consistently train at a high relative intensity, you're going to adapt to that and you're going to, you're not going to experience as much muscle damage as you would if you just did it on a very sporadic basis. So I think that a lot of the arguments against train or, you know, being very, very limited in training to failure are based off of minimizing muscle damage. And if you do it consistently enough, or if you aren't afraid of doing it from time to time, you're not going to experience like debilitating muscle damage to begin with because we're adaptive. So, um, I know I went way off, <laughs> off track on that one, but just wanted to get that, that out there while it's on my mind. No, awesome. Awesome. And I'm glad you did. So finally to wrap up, Brian, I wanted to ask you what progression looks like for you now, uh, being somebody who's, uh, well into their training career, quite advanced. Uh, I thought it'd be good to, to give the listeners um, you know, an insight as to, you know, how you progress your training, you know, your expectations around, you know, where you're going to see, uh, you know, these performance metrics climb and, you know, how you approach it. Yeah, I, I like just basic double progression. Um, I mean, people, you can use triple progression. I don't think any, either one of them is inherently better than the other. Um, you know, I still find I fall within that range of like that 12 to 20 sets per week and I'm able to progress with that. And so, and I think most people probably are. Um, but I, I think a lot of people, they, they try to, they don't realize the benefits of just increasing reps before low sometimes. Like they, they, they don't ride out the process long enough to see that progress is being made and they go to increase load too soon they're not able to handle it and they think like, okay, like whatever I was doing wasn't working because I'm not strong enough yet. Um, and when you look at, you know, from a bodybuilder's perspective and you're dealing with a lot of like isolation movements, it's like how do I get my medial delts bigger? It's increasing reps. Like you're not going to increase load on lateral raises very frequently. So, um, so to answer your question, like I, I will do, like say I'm doing four sets of, eight to 12 or something like that on lateral raises. Um, I will progress reps and, you know, I might push my last set to full failure and kind of work my way right to left. Like I talked about before and, you know, say it's, I do eight, eight, nine. The next week I might do eight, nine, nine, then nine, nine, nine. And so it's a very slow process. Um, but eventually like you will be able to add weight to the bar. So I think, a lot of advanced athletes just don't give themselves enough time, especially considering progress comes at a slower rate. Um, and then when in doubt, just push you know, to, to high relative yeah. intensities more often. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what, you know, going back to something I mentioned earlier, it's like, as long as you're recovered and you're able to replicate the prior week's performance, the prior session's performance, as long as you're pushing to a high enough relative intensity, you're probably inducing overload. So that's kind of like the idiot proof way. And I think that's something you even touched on um, in your article is, is like, when in doubt, just work hard, you know, when in doubt, go in there. And, um, you know, you, you, you always kind of know, it's like, you, if you've been in the gym a long enough time, you, you know, the sessions that, or outside of, you know, where you, you exit homeostasis, you know, you know, when those sessions occur. And then you also know the sessions where you just push way too far, you know, it's like, that was way more than I required. 
Um, and so you can kind of rely on experience there. And I think a lot of people sort of forget how to use intuition when they get too involved um, or they, they separate themselves from sort of the, the bro side versus the evidence-based side. They kind of lose their ability oftentimes to, to kind of go by feel, for lack of better words. And I think there's, there's a lot of value in that. It's like we look at, you know, fatigue. And like, if you were to ask ask somebody like, how do you define fatigue? You're going to get a hundred different responses, you know. And it, what it comes down to is, typically, like subjective measures are going to provide as much insight as anything else. Um, and so, why why would training be any different? You know, well, why would the input side of the equation be any different? Um, you know, at the end of the day, like our our body doesn't know what rep range we're in. Our body doesn't know you know, the weight that's on the bar, it just knows the imposed stress, the imposed tension that's on that muscle, the imposed tension that's on, um, you know, the, the demand that's in front of it that it has to take care of. So like that, when you kind of distill it down to that, you can realize that like a lot of it is outside of the control of just the X's and O's of programming. Like a lot of it does just have to do with subjective levels of effort in order to get to those, those points. Um, and I liked, I, you know, I love the article that you wrote because I think it's, it's important for people to understand that the advantages, like a, a lot of people, it, it looks like they're shooting from the hip and oftentimes they are, but they, they, they check that box, you know, they, they're achieving the objective that they're after. Um, they might be doing a little bit more than what they thought, but you see the bodybuilders that go in, they only train once a week and you see them with what they do in one session. You think like, Holy shit, that's way more than they need. But they also, they've realized through trial and error, it's like, okay, now it's going to take me seven days or six days to come back to feel fresh enough to do this again. And at that point they push it again, their ceiling's a little bit higher. And so they're still achieving overload. It's just, um, on a, on a different time scale than, than I think most people, are, are used to in the evidence-based community. Yeah, man, that was brilliant. I think uh, you hit that one out of the park and some very uh, good answers there. As you can probably hear, my kids are getting taken to daycare now in the background, so there's a lot of <laughs> luckers here. But uh, guys, that is uh, all for today's episode. Uh, big thank you to Brian for coming on the show uh, and dropping bombs my as pleasure. always. Um, there's going to be a lot of quotes that I take out of this one uh, to use in the future, which is always uh, very fun. Uh, guys, make sure you check out Brian uh, on his uh, social media platforms uh, and his websites. I'll link all those in the description box below. Uh, and again, thank you for coming on the show, Brian. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.